The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com and by the Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Florida Council of Arts and Culture, and the State of Florida. God only knows how much I love America. Going from one side to the other. I traveled two lane, four lane, dirt, steel ribbons spiked to the ground. Boxcars, buses, flatbeds, trucks, and trailers. The road is a passport in your mind, imprinted with every person you meet, every step you turn. I marked my trail with cigarette butts and candy wrappers. I shared my stories with housewives, Bums, businessmen, migrant farmers who spoke only broken English. Everyone I met was either going to or running away from something. I saw ornate churches with spires that pierced the sky. God's living room. I saw towns in the night, lights from their windows, people praying over their food. I watched football, baseball, every step, my step. The road was life, breath, confirmed existence. Welcome to Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. In 1957, writer Jack Kerouac was living in this house in Orlando when he found out that his novel On the Road was finally going to be published. Together with the Allen Ginsberg poem, Howl, and the William S. Burroughs novel, Naked Lunch, Kerouac's On the Road established the rebellious, counterculture, anti-establishment literary movement known as the Beat Generation. It is the, the generation after World War II who came back from war and wanted a very different life than the, the, the life in the suburbs that was kind of being set up with for them, the, the house in the suburbs, the car, the two kids, and, and these were people who came back and challenged the status quo and challenged, uh, you know, regular society. And uh, Jack was really at the forefront of that with his kind of wandering lifestyle and his willingness to experiment with things you know he's an, at an age he should have been married with a couple of kids and you know a, a job in a bank and and he's doing something totally different so uh, from what I understand it that's the beats were the people they were kind of the hippies of their generation they refused to be put in a box and they went out and um, explored personally and also you know religiously they uh, were interested in Buddhism and they were like take all, uh, all of the confines off and see, see what, you know, what we want to do. Jack Kerouac came up with the term beat, and a lot of that had to do with a couple of different things. So you have beat in terms of being tired and having the like, oh, I'm beat. And a lot of that generation felt exhausted. It was, you know, post-World War II, um, and they were out of sorts with maybe mainstream America which was all very excited to, you know, do the house and the car and the, the nuclear family. And the Beat Generation wanted poetry and jazz and this more um, roaming lifestyle. So the Beat Generation is a precursor in a lot of ways to the whole hippie movement. Um, and the hippie movement in a lot of ways um, adopted the beats. Um, so the, the beat, the beatnik, all of that stuff comes from there. And beat poetry, which is sort of, 
you know, the beginning of Poetry Slams. And um, Allen Ginsberg's Howl, that poem starts that, uh, I saw the best of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical. And it's this long, epic poem. Poetry like that, th th there wasn't poetry like that in the mainstream before Howell. And um, it really exploded what is possible in the literary world. Lawrence Ferling Getty, the great poet who was the poet laureate of the United States when he published Howell, was thrown in prison for um, obscenity. So these guys were trailblazers. And I mean, they were talking about a countercultural lifestyle at a time of McCarthyism, um, at a time of communist paranoia. So these guys really stuck their neck out for what they believed in. And it wasn't just guys for that matter. Um, young writers like Joyce Johnson with her wonderful book, uh, Minor Characters, Anne Douglas. Um, so this was really a movement throughout the United States. And they did set the groundwork for the counterculture and the hippies, for better or worse. And um, they were trailblazers. And I think um, there, was a, there was a quote from Ferlinghetti who talked about, you know, we live in a freer, more open United States because of the beats. So, in America, when the sun goes down, and I sit on the old broken down river pier watching the long, long skies over New Jersey, and sense all that raw land that rolls in one unbelievable huge bulge over to the west coast, and all that road going, and all the people dreaming in the immensity of it. In an Iowa, I know by now that children must be crying in the land where they let the children cry. And tonight the stars will be out, and don't you know that God is Pooh Bear? The evening star must be drooping and shedding her sparkler dims on the prairie which is just before the coming of complete night that blesses the earth, darkens all the rivers, cups the peaks, and folds the final shore in. Nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen to anybody besides the forlorn rags of growing old. Think of Dean Moriarty, I even think of old Dean Moriarty, the father we never found. Think of Dean Moriarty, I think of Dean Moriarty. <laughs> There's still a lot of people who don't know who Kerouac is or know anything about the Beat Generation. Um, but I think even the people who are not necessarily familiar with his name have heard of On the Road. And because it was such a change from everything that had come before, I mean, that is the quintessential great American novel. It is about America. It is a, you know, about finding America. It is about our relationship with land and cars and belonging. He wrote it in three weeks. He uh, got a roll of teletype paper and he just kind of just really didn't sleep. He, as you know, he's an alcoholic and he, and he did a lot of Benzedrine, which is like Woods is an upper. And, uh, and it just, he just wrote all the way. He never had any punctuation. I don't know if you've seen the roll or not, but it's just like, it was amazing, and he did it in three weeks. And then he went back and edited it, of course, and you could see on the roll where he's actually marked it out. And, but it was just the fact that he could do that, and it was just flew, flew out of him. It was amazing to me. While the book On the Road has had a profound effect on generations of readers, that novel and the work of other beat writers has not been universally embraced. Truman Capote famously criticized On the Road, saying that it was typing, not writing. Not only for the content, which was very subversive to young people, to be talking about other religions when everyone should be a, a white Protestant, um, or talking about psychedelic drugs or other sexual experiences. Um, so there, there, was, there was that whole side of it, but then there was the writing itself, which you know, obviously, probably looking back didn't follow norms either. <laughs> and so, um, you know, capitals and periods and sentence structure were all sort of upside down. And um, so from many angles, probably teachers and parents, um, you know, and good upstanding citizens found this a little hard to swallow. I mean, how can we even have a book that hasn't been edited, you know, to correct English. And uh, I'm sure that it just really sent some of 
some of them up the wall that it was even published. In the play, we have a line from Capote, actually, who criticized him quite harshly because of his, his style of writing. He wrote almost non-stop streaming type style, whereas Capote was more of a stop and start writer like many of the writers were. Stop, you think about what you're going to write, then you write it, then you stop and you think about what you're going to write, and then you write it. Kerouac was just, you know, going 90 miles an hour all the time. Well, it was so different, I think, as kind of contemporaneous uh, uh, riffing, you know, that they, you know, took their lead from improvisational jazz. Um, it was something, yeah, you had to sort of wrap your head around a little bit and get used to the, the way that the prose was put together. So, yeah, there was a group of people who um, hated it. And of course, there was a whole group of people who absolutely hated it on the road when it came out. And there was another group of people who absolutely loved it. I think the, the thing that came out of that was that whichever way you decided, Kerouac certainly shook up uh, the American literary scene when that book came out. Um, and, and it's the set today, you, you still have the, the group of people like, who like hate Kerouac and his style. And uh, there's this group, we get lots of them here that just absolutely love it and read his books and come by the house to, to see the place. We call them pilgrims. For years, rumors had circulated that Jack Kerouac had been living in Orlando when his most important work, On the Road, was published, but no one seemed to know exactly where his home was located. Investigative journalist Bob Keeling tracked down the location of the home, and an article published in the Orlando Sentinel in March 1997 sparked an interest in preserving the house. Bob became intrigued with the idea that Jack had lived here, and, and while it was known he lived in Florida, it was never really uh, much of a focus. It was like, oh, you know, it's all about Lowell and, and Massachusetts. And so um, Bob set out to find out exactly where he lived and through contacting um, so one of his relatives was able to find out that he lived here at this house. Uh, coincidentally, when he came to this house, it was um, about to be demolished and in very, very poor shape, as he describes in his book. So uh, they really just got straight on it and were able to raise the money from um, Jeff Cole uh, and several other um, people kicked in money too and saved the house. Bob had heard, heard about um, that Kerouac had lived here in College Park and then set to finding out well, where was it, where was it, and finally he tracked down, he finally ended up talking to John, um, John Sampras who was Jack's brother-in-law and the executive of the state said, oh, I think it's here. and so. Uh, 14, 18 and a half, which was the back then. And so he came and found this place in terrible disrepair. And, and um, so, um, and then he wrote about it in the um, Sentinel, or a long article. And that's where a group of people got together and said, well, we need to do something because a developer was set to tear this place down and get rid of it. So a, gr a group of people uh, including Bob and Marty Cummins, who ran a uh, bookstore over here in College Park, um, chapters in it. They got together and said, well, let's create the Kerouac Project and let's try and preserve this place and that legacy here. His sister and brother-in-law came here in 1956. Uh, his brother-in-law wanted to try and um, get work in the burgeoning space industry. And they had Jack's mom's only grandchild with them. They were the only real nuclear family in Kerouac's family. So where his sister went, where his mother went, Kerouac would often follow, coming in off the road, dead tired, needing a place to crash, maybe get some work done. So that's what brought him to Orlando in 1956. He came down here with his mom, whom he was overly attached to, or she to him, somehow. They were a little symbiotic there. And uh, he lived in the back of the house and he wrote Dharma Bums here. And this is where he became famous. When he came here, he was uh, just an obscure writer. Um, nobody really knew who he was and, and is demonstrated by the fact that he didn't even rent the house, he rented the room at the back. So he wasn't uh, up and coming enough to own, to rent the whole house. And he'd been here, I think about two or three weeks and he uh, got the uh, good reviews and went up to New York and came back um, famous in basically a, a very different circumstance. He was very attached to his sister 
and, and his mother. And his mo- mother was also very, very attached to his sister. And so that's what brought him here. What brought him to this place because two and a half blocks that way, um, his sister and brother-in-law had moved down here. And so Jack came and they stayed there, but Jack couldn't stand living in such close quarters with his brother-in-law. So the, this place two and a half blocks away was where they could walk there and he could um, live. And so, yeah, so that's what, it was always family that kept bringing him back to this place and why he eventually bought a house in St. Petersburg and settled down there, you know, where he died. He did a great deal of work while he was living in Orlando. He did the final edits to his seminal novel of the 20th century, On the Road. But then once he saw success with that, he comes back to Orlando basically to get out of the glare of the spotlight of everybody wanting interviews and wanting to talk with the newly crowned bard of the beat generation. So Orlando becomes his refuge. And during the next four or five months at the end of 1957 in the little back porch apartment in Orlando, this is really his last prolific period. He writes dozens of letters to people like Marlon Brando, urging him to do the film version of On the Road. And in fact, he ends the letter with a great sign off. He says, I wanna hear from you, Marlon, put up your dukes and write. And there was a plan for Brando to do On the Road, but unfortunately Kerouac's agent held out for too much money and the deal never got done. But beyond the letters, beyond the poems, he wrote his follow-up book, Dharma Bums, in 11 frenetic days and nights in that college park house uh, in November and December of 1957. Um, So not only did he live in Central Florida, he did some of the greatest work of his career here, and that's certainly worth commemorating and celebrating. My favorite, actually, of his work is, um, it's called The Dharma Bums, and he wrote that right in that room. So it's it's very cool to be in that space where he wrote um, that book. I've studied Buddhism. I've written my own haikus. Listen to this, man. Listen to this. In the darkness, I notice a TV set. I watch it anyway. Feet pound the pavement. The flower on the sidewalk ignores them. On the wall, a picture of a shipwreck hangs crookedly. A black boy eating vanilla ice cream smiles. Far out, man. I worked with uh, Marty Cummins uh, at uh, Chapters in the old College Park, and uh, he was on the Kerouac board at the time, and we were talking about it, and and I thought, oh, that'd be kind of an interesting thing to try to, because I do one-man shows. I do old man Christmas Carol and different, different other shows. And I thought it'd be interesting to, to uh, maybe explore his life. And my friend Steve, who I wrote it with, happened to be at a performance of my one-man Christmas Carol when Marty was talking to me about it. And he said, why don't we write it together? And we'd never done anything together. So we, we, we started back and forth. Uh, he would write a chunk and I would write a chunk and then I'd start putting things together. And uh, it just turned out to be uh, kind of a really cool uh, way to do it. And that's what we started in 2002. And Marty uh, was the first one to produce it. So, In the play, we deal quite a bit with his family, with his sister, his brother, who died very young. He was very devoted to his brother. So his family life affected a lot of the things he wrote and the way that he wrote. So uh, it's very important to add that aspect in when you're considering a character for a play. You don't want him to be one-dimensional and live only in the works that he's created, but you want to go deeper into his soul so you can make sure that you have an accurate portrayal on the uh, on stage of the guy. Whenever you have a, a writer that's as prolific as he was, there's so much in his writing that you can discover. And I, I hate to see writers like him just fall by the wayside because they're just as relevant today. And he is very much just as relevant. And so I, I'm excited that, that um, a lot of people will be just discovering him. And we're hoping that people will come see the show. If they haven't read any of his books, they'll go get one, you know. And, uh, and if they are a big fan, that they'll go, wow, they really did a good job representing him and his life. That's what I'm hoping for. That's the way it was. 
In the early days, when the streets were ours and our talent was brash and unbending, I wandered the streets of New York and San Francisco with poets and bums. Some of them were my friends. Gregory Corso and Allen Ginsberg were like the same person then, like a beast walking on the same two legs, walking the dingy streets in the darkness, but always watching for the light, the light of the street lamp the warm glow of the morning sun as it crept up over the buildings. Alan was the brain of the beast, analytical, cold, unfeeling bastard. Gregory was the heart, caring, loving, beating this way and that. And me, I was the soul, curious, looking for meaning in everything and everyone. Two of the three most popular Kerouac books, which you know, is on the road, Dharma Bombs, and Big Sur. Well, Big Sur and Dharma Bums were both written here in Orlando, and of course, uh, Dharma Bums right here in this house. So, yeah. So some of his uh, best work was done here in in um, Orlando, this house, and he lived in another place, um, Kingswood Manor, just a little north of here, where he owned a house for a while, and then he had bought another house that he was going to move into and hope to have some people come and live with him, and he could teach them about writing, but. That place was at San Landro Springs, and the state took it. It's in the middle of I-4 in Altamont Springs now, and never got to see his dream come there. But, but Jack has a long association with Central Florida and, of course, St. Petersburg. Jack Kerouac died in St. Petersburg, Florida in 1969, but was buried in his hometown of Lowell, Massachusetts. Kerouac's sister, Carolyn, passed away five years earlier in Orlando and remains there in the historic Greenwood Cemetery. That's another tragic story. Um, Nin, Carolyn was her name, and she died younger than he did. And she had uh, her son, Paul Blake Jr., uh, was going to Edgewater High School. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, her marriage broke up with Paul's dad. And as legend has it, as she's in her uh, apartment at the 14th Fairway Apartments in Dubstred, she gets the call from him that he wants a divorce and she supposedly had a heart attack and died right there. And during the course of my research, I, I discovered that Carolyn Kerouac was buried in an unmarked grave at Greenwood Cemetery, which of course is Orlando's oldest, most historic um, cemetery. And the docent there, Don Price, uh, was generous enough to arrange to get a stone to finally mark her grave. But the sad part is that um, she's buried with the man who broke her heart. So it's kind of a sad irony there, but at least now, and she was a veteran too, and uh, she's recognized for her service, but that's another very sad chapter in Kerouac's life in Florida. The Orlando house where Jack Kerouac lived on the corner of Clouser Avenue and Shady Lane Drive is not a museum. It is the site of an active writers in residence program. We have uh, four residents a year come. They get to spend three months in the house a year. Um, they stay free. You know, we cover the cost, and then we give them a thousand dollar food stipend so so they can feed themselves while they're here. And basically, we don't require very much of them except to come and write our investment in them. And we're we're looking for um, emerging writers. So we're looking at those people. Maybe they publish one book or maybe, maybe not, but they've got the talent that if some investment of time, which is the thing that we can give them, will really help them along. And so that's what we're looking for, writers like that. And so we do, we don't demand very much of them except that they come and write and make as full a use of the facility here as they can while, they, while they're here. Remembering Kerouac and honoring his legacy is important in terms of honoring what the novel is and not honoring it as a still living and relevant form. I think a lot of times people forget how important a book can be and how it has this power to change your internal thought pattern. Um, so I think Kerouac really can stand for that. He, he's somebody who you can use as a model for. A book can change the way you think, and a book can change the way you decide to pursue your life. The future is uncertain for the home where Jack Kerouac spent his final years in St. Petersburg, 
but the home in Orlando, where he produced some of his most important work, was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2013. You've been watching Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. Visit us anytime on the web at myfloridahistory.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Brokemarkle. The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com and by the Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Florida Council of Arts and Culture, and the State of Florida.